We were so pleased that both Talia and Evan were able to come, and it's not often you get two people of such stature in a movement to speak together on a platform. They're, they're used to going around the world speaking, but normally people only get one of them. So we're really, really pleased to have both of them here uh, uh, this morning. From the earliest days of marriage equality here in Ireland, we had links with our friends in America to see how they were managing their journey to marriage equality. And indeed, we had the pleasure of hosting Mark Solomon, whom I saw in some of the, the photographs there, fresh from the success in Massachusetts, where they'd won marriage equality in the legislature. And Mark worked with us here uh, in, in Dublin uh, on one of marriage equality's earliest strategic planning processes to um, share with us the processes that they had used and the learning that they had uh, there. And indeed, it was from him that we borrowed and Meninia Griffith spoke yesterday about the Out to Your TD campaign. That was, that was um, uh, his gift to us and uh, it really paid dividends for us in our marriage equality uh, journey. And really, this is about getting local voters to visit their elected representatives and asking them to take on marriage equality uh, as an issue. Um, it was an incredibly successful campaign strategy, and indeed it is one that we are seeing other campaigns here in Ireland on a variety of issues copying. And I think that people copying what you're doing in a campaign is a real sign of success, uh, 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 and, and, and other campaigns are using that. Targeting uh, uh, TDs was just one of the many shortcuts to success that we imported from our American friends. And as I said already this morning, I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, two other long-standing friends of marriage equality, Evan Wilson and uh, uh, Thalia Zaptos from Freedom to Marry. Evan is, as you know, an attorney and a long-time gay rights activist, a native of New York. He's also author of Why Marriage Matters. He was listed by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Folks. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, uh, with Panty, exactly. Uh, a graduate of Yale and Harvard Law Schools, he also taught law at Columbia, Rutgers and Whittier Law Schools. And from 89 to 2001, he worked full time with uh, Lamba, Lambda, the Legal Defence and Education Fund, where he directed uh, their marriage project and coordinated the National Freedom to Marry Coalition, which was in fact the forerunner of Freedom to Marry. Um, he co-wrote the amicus brief in Bear versus uh, Rika, very important Supreme Court case of Hawaii that was reflected there, which the court finally there said that prohibiting same-sex marriage in that state constituted discrimination. And in some ways, it was the first big win uh, and set the ball rolling for, for many, many other court appearances. Um, Evan uh, came to Ireland um, during uh, uh, the uh, run-up to the campaign and spoke with many of us uh, in the movement, uh, sharing his advice and, and insights. Uh, and I think his presence uh, during that time helped us towards forming what eventually became uh, the Marriage Equality Coalition of Yes Equality. And his insights and supports to us uh, during our journey, I think, have been invaluable. And I'd like to invite Evan to share his reflections with us this morning. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It is really a joy to be back in Ireland and to be here with friends and colleagues and heroes. And so we all please join me in thanking our Irish counterparts, hosts, and leaders for their achievement last year and for bringing us together in this extremely important network for the work going forward. So with victories last year in Ireland, in the United States, and in Colombia, we now have, as you see up here, in the world, 22 countries on six continents where same-sex couples share in the freedom to marry. Uh, 22 countries on six continents, up from zero less than two decades ago. That's one billion people one billion people in the world who now live in a freedom to marry country, nearly 15% of the world's population. That's pretty extraordinary, much bigger than most people think, remarkable progress for all of us, but of course 15% is not the 100% that we want, so we all have a lot more work to do. The United States, I'm happy to say, contributed to those numbers and to the momentum when, as you all know, Last year, on June 26, 
our Supreme Court affirmed the freedom to marry for same-sex couples. The victory brought affirmation, security, dignity, and happiness to millions of people. Same-sex couples, our children, our parents, our friends, and our families. The victory was also a vindication of America's promise, a promise that many of our societies make. It was an example of our own country living up to its human rights ideals. And the victory also marked a resounding transformation for our campaign to win marriage nationwide in the United States, much as we celebrate the victory of the Irish campaign in getting Ireland where it needed to be. More than a million people now live, sorry, more than a million gay people are now legally married in the United States. And happily so far, the gays have not used up all the marriage licenses. There's still plenty of marriage left in the United States for everyone to share. As in Ireland, ours was not an overnight victory. As you saw in the video, it was the product of more than 40 years of work and struggle and losses and sacrifice, as well as hope. As you also saw in the video, I started in this work pretty long ago, back in my hair days. And I've been working to advance this cause, LGBT freedom and rights and inclusion, including the freedom to marry, for quite a long time. In 1983, I wrote my law school thesis on why gay people should have the freedom to marry. The paper had two major themes. Gay people should have the freedom to marry, and we should fight for the freedom to marry. I argued then, first, that marriage is important. Being denied marriage is wrong. The unfair denial harms gay people and our families. I argued there was a pathway to victory under our Constitution's guarantees of human rights, and therefore we should have it. Second, I argued that fighting for the freedom to marry would be claiming a vocabulary of love, commitment, inclusion, connectedness, family, dignity, and equality. That this marriage vocabulary of shared values would be an engine of transformation that would help non-gay people better understand who gay people are and why all discrimination, marriage and otherwise, is wrong. Now, although I was early and tenacious, I was not the first person to advocate for the freedom to marry. In my 1983 paper, I was writing about cases brought by couples even more than 10 years before. We usually, somewhat erroneously, mark the dawn of the modern gay rights movement as the rebellion that took place at Stonewall a bar in New York where people fought back against police harassment. And we tend to mark that Stonewall Rebellion through parades and events and, and, and ceremonies and observations now all around the world. But the first wave of marriage litigation came in the immediate aftermath of Stonewall. Stonewall was 1969. There were major cases brought by couples seeking the freedom to marry in the United States one of which even reached the United States Supreme Court as early as 1972. In all of those early cases, those immediate post-Stonewall cases, the courts rubber-stamped the discrimination. The courts refused to overturn it. And even the United Supreme, States Supreme Court blew those couples away. It didn't even bother to write an opinion. It wrote one sentence. There is no federal constitutional claim here. The courts and the country in those early days were simply not ready. There had not yet been enough conversation. Now one big lesson from this story so far is that we lost. We lost a lot. We lost and lost and lost and lost over 40 years of struggle before the victory we celebrate today. The other big lesson that I think we have to share with those who are still on the front lines pushing our cause forward is in the story of how we went 
from the United States Supreme Court getting it so wrong in 1972 to affirming the freedom to marry and reflecting this resounding transformation last year. To read the full story of how that happened and to be able to really pull out the lessons and apply them to the work still underway that many of you are leading, I encourage you to go to our website, freedomtomarry.org, which before we closed, we transformed into a hub and resource center with lots of stories, in-depth memos, videos, and other ways and tools in which people can carry the work forward, all of which are available for plagiarizing and use going forward. But the short answer to the question of how we went from losing in 1972 to winning last year is that we won marriage in the United States by successfully, over time, bringing together three key ingredients, a movement, a strategy, and a campaign. Now, we won under our Constitution, our Constitution, our national commitment to certain principles and values and legal guarantees. But the Constitution didn't just fulfill its own promise. It took those three things, a movement, a strategy, and a campaign to get that constitutional promise fulfilled. First, it took a multitudinous movement. No one person alone, no one organization alone, no one state, no one legal case, no one methodology of social change, no one battle, no one year, no one decade alone did it. There was no magic wand. It took millions of conversations, millions of dollars, many organizations, and many battles that changed hearts and minds and helped the American people rise to fairness. It took a movement to move the country under the Constitution to the law. But at the same time, this movement of many, this necessary multitude, was not just a random series of episodes. With this movement, there was a strategy, a strategy that we stuck with. Now, not everyone necessarily knew there was a strategy. Not everyone necessarily followed the strategy as in reading a script. Not everyone necessarily agreed with the strategy. But a critical mass committed to and came forward with and stuck with the strategy that laid out the pathway as to what was needed to make this movement ferment amount to what it would take to get the job done. A movement, a strategy, and third, a campaign. A campaign that was built to drive that strategy and to leverage the many, many parts of the movement in order to get the job done. And that campaign, that campaign organization, was Freedom to Marry, the organization that Thalia and Mark Solomon and our extraordinary team and I came together and got to work through not to do everything, but to help make sure that all the pieces contributed by so many were amounting to what the strategy required in order to get the job done. It was the combination of all of that, the Constitution's human rights guarantees, a decades-long movement, a successful strategy, and a tenacious campaign that delivered through many, many stumbles and failures as well as successes what President Obama called justice that comes like a thunderbolt. Now, different countries, different causes, different strategies. Every, every goal, every circumstance may entail a different strategy to get to the goal. So it's not as simple as saying, okay, here's what Ireland did, 
or here's what the United States did, we just do exactly the same thing and voila, we have the result. Goal dictates strategy and circumstances must shape the strategy toward achieving the goal in different countries and different causes. But the elements that were in, in embraced in Ireland, in the United States, in so much of the other great work that's happened around the world and is underway now, the elements of change, the elements in different strategies, I believe are very applicable and very adaptable to the work of all kinds of different causes in all kinds of different countries. So what was the strategy then that we followed in the United States? The strategy for the United States, different from Ireland, was that we were going to win in our giant country by persuading our Supreme Court to get right what it had gotten wrong in 1972. Now first let me be clear, this was not a secret strategy. It was on Freedom to Marry's website. We wanted people to know. We weren't worried that our opponents were gonna find it out. We wanted everyone to know the pathway to the goal we proclaimed. We wanted people to understand it, organizations, allies, partners, and individuals, and be able to bring their pieces to the strategy. And whoever was working on the strategy, we were happy to lift up and acclaim and give credit to and ideally try to bring resources to as long as it amounted to, this, to a contribution to the strategy and what it entailed. At Freedom to Marry, we called our national strategy the Roadmap to Victory. Now, as you may know, in the United States, unlike Ireland and most other countries, marriage licenses are issued by the states, not by the national government. We have 50 states. So in theory, that meant 50 legal experiences of discrimination denying gay couples the national freedom to marry. But our strategy was not to go one by one by one within the four corners of all 50 states plodding through Mississippi in the year 2030 to get to victory. Our states are bound by the Constitution. The Constitution provides a floor below which the states may not go. So our strategy aimed for a ruling from the Supreme Court under the Constitution to bring the whole country to national res resolution. And that national strategy meant that we didn't have to win every state, but we had to win enough states. And our strategy understood that we didn't have to persuade every American to support the freedom to marry, but we had to bring along enough Americans in order to empower, embolden, and inspire the Supreme Court to get the job right. Our work was to create the climate that would get the decision makers, elected officials, lawmakers, judges, and the justices of the Supreme Court to do the right thing. Now, as we sketched it out in our Roadmap to Victory strategy, we said we would work on three tracks simultaneously to create that climate. We would work to, one, build a critical mass of states where couples could marry. We would, two, alongside one, build a critical mass of public support, growing a majority nationwide. And three, alongside the first two, we would tackle and end the federal marriage discrimination, making sure that the federal government treated couples who got legally married with the same federal protections and responsibilities as any other couples received. And when stuck on one of these tracks, when we couldn't quite win a state, when we lost a battle in a state, or when we couldn't yet move the next seg segment of the American people, we could work on one of the other tracks. And the work on each of these tracks would allow us never to get stuck, never to get stymied, but instead to create more ammo, more opportunity to keep reinforcing and moving forward on the overall work of creating the climate in which renewed litigation could succeed. The progress and synergy 
on each of these tracks, we believed, would create the climate that would allow for, eventually, the national resolution. So to achieve the, ma the critical mass of states and the critical mass of support, we developed numerous and varied programs and partnerships that allowed different organizations and millions of individuals and many methodologies of change, litigation, legislation, public education, direct action, fundraising, even electoral work and candidates, that would allow all these different pieces to each bring their parts to the whole in fulfillment of the central strategy to get the job done. Now, for example, to build the critical mass of states that our strategy called for, we had to figure out how to build different kinds of campaigns to win in very different states. In some states, we could work and were able to get litigation wins. But in many states, our attempts at litigation were blocked or rejected by the courts. And so in those states where we couldn't or didn't win in court, we eventually had to learn how to deliver legislative wins in epic battles, battles, for example, that turned out to be very transformative of public opinion and political momentum, as in, for example, the Battle of New York, where after having lost in court and then lost in the legislature, we eventually were able to win, enabling my husband and me to get married in the state where we live. And when blocked in courts and blocked in the legislatures through a wave of attack constitutional amendments that Karl Rove and the Republican machine and the anti-gay industry piled on us throughout the 2000s, we lost about 30 ballot measure battles and constitutional amendment barriers were erected preventing the courts and the legislatures from doing their job. When we had to deal with that wave of attacks and those barricades that were erected in more than 30 states, we eventually learned even how to win ballot measure battles, where we persuaded the majorities to end discrimination against the minority. As I said, our opponents had defeated us more than 30 times more than 30 painful, stinging defeats, the most famous of one many of you may have heard of, Proposition 8 in California, where we'd actually won in courts. Couples had begun getting married, and it was snatched away through the political process. But eventually, we learned as a campaign and as a movement how to overcome that final barrier. And in 2012, we were able to win not just our first one, but four out of four, signaling a momentous shift in the political climate that set the stage for us to then get back to the Supreme Court now with the momentum of having fulfilled the strategy. Now, in the two years leading up to the Supreme Court win in 2015, so from 2013 to 2015, our movement won more than 70 court rulings. Court after court after court, federal courts and state courts, trial courts and appellate courts, judges appointed by Republicans, the more conservative to say the least, as well as Democrats. More than 70 courts looked at the arguments, weighed the evidence, and found that there is no legitimate reason for government to deny loving and committed same-sex couples, the freedom to marry. And I encourage you to remember that number and to take advantage of that immense stockpile of vetting that has already happened so that whenever you're having a debate with anyone, no one should be able to present this as a new question or an experiment or a tested, an untested issue because in the United States, on top of all the experience in the 22 countries worldwide, court after court after court, legislature after legislature has looked at all the arguments and weighed the experience to find that there is no good reason for perpetuating this discrimination. And when I say 70 courts we had won in all these different cases in that buildup to the Supreme Court, remember, we had lost in the 70s. 
we had lost in the 80s, we had lost in the 90s, we had lost in the 2000s, and we'd even lost a handful in the 2010s. But through the cumulative power of working this strategy and making the case, we began winning and began piling up a mountain of analysis and evidence on our side. Now, out of all of those 70, 70 plus court rulings in favor of the freedom to marry, my favorite passage came in the case in which we brought the freedom to marry to Utah. Utah, some of you may know, one of, if not the most conservative states in the United States, one of the most religious states in the United States, one of the most monolithic states in the United States. And in that case in Utah, where the judge ruled in favor of the freedom to marry, he wrote, quote, it is not the Constitution that has changed. What's changed is our knowledge of what it means to be lesbian or gay. In that passage, he encapsulated the whole strategy. It wasn't that we needed like new legal arguments. It wasn't that we needed to put it somehow out there that in a way that we hadn't before. The legal arguments that won in Utah, that ultimately won two years later in the Supreme Court, were the very same legal arguments that I had made back as a law student on that badly typed paper. They were the very same arguments that those pioneering marriage couples had brought forth even 10 years earlier in the 70s when they went to the Supreme Court and were blown away. It wasn't that we needed new legal arguments. It was, what, that, it was that what we needed was a drumbeat making those arguments and touching hearts and minds and telling stories and making it personal and authentic and emotional and real in the language of shared values over time to help the public, help the decision makers, help the judges open their hearts, change their minds, and be willing to see how the Constitution's command that was always there applies to the people before them. And the key engine of that tremendous transformation was not lawyering, it was not legal arguments, it was conversation. Getting people to talk about real people, real stories, real values. And as we did that, as we engaged in that over time through many losses, hearts and minds changed, and then the law followed. Now, as we accelerated our freedom to marry momentum, we also accelerated the gains for other things we cared about. And in the marriage chapter of our movement in the United States, unlike the previous chapter where we had stopped fighting for marriage, we won more non-discrimination protections, more protections against gender identity discrimination, more safe schools programs, more acknowledgement of the needs of seniors, all because the marriage vocabulary is not just about marriage. It is about this engine of empathy and understanding that helps people move on the entirety of what we seek. <coughs> the paramount lesson for those who seek progress is to foster hope and to provide clarity to show the pathway and the need for moving forward. Through all the many years that I was preaching, we need to fight for marriage. We can win. We should do this. Here's how to build a campaign. My lodestar, the mantra I carried with me, came from a French suffrage fighter, a wo one of the women who led the fight to win the freedom to vote, the right to vote for women in France, paving the way for much of the rest of the world. Her name was Hubertine Eau Claire, and she was actually the woman who coined the word feminism. Hubertine Eau Claire said, more than 100 years ago, if you would obtain a right, first you must proclaim it. If you want to have a right, first you must put it forward. You must put forward a vision. You must believe that you can attain it and you must show the way forward 
so that others can rally and bring their parts to the work. Affirming love, affirming freedom, inclusion, dignity, and equality is something that rule of law societies like the United States, like Europe, must do. In countries as diverse as Austria and Australia, the Czech Republic and China, countries like Korea, Japan, Nepal, Taiwan, Vietnam, urgent work is now underway to win the freedom to marry and to lift the burden of oppression and exclusion off of gay and transgender people. And of course, urgent work is underway and needed in diverse countries who are, where people are fighting for basic freedom and basic safety, countries as diverse as Russia and India and Indonesia and Bangladesh. In this worldwide human rights struggle, countries like ours should be leading, not lagging. And in particular here, we have to note that the world looks to Europe to spearhead progress. And of course, people in your countries depend on the work that all of us do to lift this burden off of people and to inspire activity and action and movement around the world. We have a tremendous opportunity as a network, as a team, sharing lessons, building off of one another in this worldwide conversation around gay people, transgender people, the freedom to marry, and basic human rights. It took us in the United States more than 40 years to win the freedom to marry, and we're still not finished on the many other fronts on which we must fight and finish our work in the United States. It took us more than 40 years to achieve this victory, but it will take you less. It will take you less because we all now live in a different and transformed world. We are in a different world at a different time with different momentum and different tools available. Let's get the job done. <laughs>